When humans first arrived in North America, they encountered wildlife more ferocious than can be found anywhere in the world today. Bears that made grizzlies look like puppy dogs, big cats almost twice the size of any living wild tiger, and the largest wild cattle species that ever lived. In this video, we're going to take a look at every megafauna species that lived alongside the first North Americans. Note, as megafauna sometimes has different meanings, we'll be using the definition that includes any animal weighing more than 100 pounds or 46 kg. We'll start with some true Americans, the camels. Yes, camelids, the family that includes camels and llamas, actually evolved in North America and spread from their home to both South America and over the Bering Land Bridge to Asia. Sadly, as you know, they no longer live in North America, but early Americans would have encountered the stout-legged llama and a couple of Hemiochenia species, the lineage that gave rise to all living laminoids. The stout-legged llama and Hemiochenia could both get pretty big, up to about 660 pounds and 880 pounds respectively, but nowhere near as big as the American camel, Camelops, which stood up to 7 foot at the shoulder and weighed a whopping 1800 pounds, making it both taller and heavier than a moose. Which brings us on to our next extinct species, Cervalsis scotti, the stag moose. Similar in size to the moose, its closest living relative, though it did look quite different, sporting some crazy ornate headgear and a muzzle that was more akin to that of typical deer rather than the unusual muzzle of the moose. Another cervid that lived alongside early Americans was the American mountain deer, a close relative to the mule deer and white-tailed deer. Though it seems it was quite a lot larger, I can't find a good source for its exact size. Many of you are aware of the pronghorn, a living species said to be the second fastest land animal in the world today. But did you know that it had at least four cousins living alongside it until around 12,000 years ago? A very similar and close relative named the Pacific pronghorn, also Stachocerus, Tetramerix, which looks pretty metal in my opinion, and the smallest, the dwarf pronghorn. Consider this, the fastest predator in North America today is the coyote, which can hit about 43 miles per hour. Why then can the pronghorn reach 60 miles per hour, making it the fastest prey animal in the world? Why waste all those evolutionary points? What's with the need for speed? Many believe it was because before the pronghorn spent its days outrunning coyotes, it evolved to outrun a much faster predator. Meet the American cheetah, Miracinonyx. Though Miracinonyx is not a true cheetah, after pumas and jaguarundis, its closest living relative is indeed the cheetah. While its physiology suggests it wasn't as specialized for speed as the cheetah we know today, it still seems as though it would have been an incredibly fast cat. Its elbow morphology was something between that of a cougar and a cheetah, meaning it still retained some ability to grapple its prey, and it retained retractable claws, unlike the true cheetahs, which lost their retractability to gain increased traction while running. It's believed that the main prey items of the American cheetah were mountain goats, wild horses, and especially pronghorns. American cheetahs would have been in competition with pumas, jaguars, but also some even more impressive cats. Homotherium, the scimitar-toothed cat, which was similar in size to the African lioness. The North American saber-tooth, Smilodon fatalis, which was about the size of a modern Siberian tiger. And the real big boy, the American lion, the largest cat that ever lived, about twice the weight of a typical African lion today. To me, it's insane to imagine early Americans living alongside and competing with all those big cats. Another true American is the horse. Like camels, horses too evolved in North America. And there was actually a huge diversity of wild horses when humans first arrived there. As many as 11 species even, though the species status of some are debated. Equus lambe, Scotty and Alaske were true horses, meaning more closely related to horses than to asses or zebras. Given their close relation, many considered the introduction of the Mustang to America to actually be a reintroduction and an example of Pleistocene rewilding. There is an impressive contested species named Equus giganteus, which if legitimate was the largest horse that ever lived, weighing up to 3,300 pounds, far larger than any living bison even. It is contested though, because it is known only from one fossil tooth. This tooth would suggest it was larger even than any giant domestic breed like the Shire horse, but it could also have been a tooth from a horse that had highly specialized dentition or some other such variable. Two others are of note, Harrington Hippus francisi, a species of stilt-legged horse. Today's zebras, asses and horses all belong to the Equus genus, but the stilt-legged horses were a separate genus. There was also the American zebra, 
which wasn't actually a zebra. Though it did belong to the Equus genus, it is more distantly related to zebras, asses and horses than they are to one another. Horses, llamas and others migrated to South America, but there was also some South American emigration when the continents connected. This saw to the arrival of some oddballs, like the giant ground sloths. Early North Americans would have encountered four species. Zibalbionics and Shasta ground sloth were lion-sized, but their relatives, Harlan's ground sloth and Jefferson's ground sloth, could weigh over a ton. There were also some huge armadillo relatives, Holmesina, which was about four times the size of the giant armadillo we have today, but was quite physically similar, as its snout was elongated and its back plates were segmented. This allowed for increased mobility, unlike the other huge North American armadillo cousin, Glyptotherium, a four-legged armored tank which could weigh over a ton but definitely was not mobile. Another familiar South American that arrived in North America was the capybara. The first North Americans would have encountered a handful of capybara species, one of which was almost twice the size of the capybara we know and love, approaching weights of 250 pounds. Possibly the least well-known South American immigrant was Mixotoxodon. This absolute behemoth weighed over 8,000 pounds and belonged to a now extinct clade known as the South American ungulates. In appearance and likely ecology, it was similar to a rhino, though they are not closely related. Mixotoxodon may have been too large as an adult to suffer predation, but if there was a predator who could do it, it might have been the giant short-faced bear. This monster stood up to 11 feet on its hind legs and could achieve weights over 2,000 pounds, making it even larger than the polar bear. Alongside its larger cousin was a lesser short-faced bear and a species named the Florida Spectacled Bear, a close relative of South America's Spectacled Bear, which still lives today. Who knows how the grizzly bear and black bear interacted with their extinct cousins? Though we perhaps think of tapirs and peccaries as being South American species today, both actually evolved in Eurasia before migrating to North America and later establishing themselves in South America. The first North Americans would have encountered the extinct California tapir and there were also tapirs present in southeastern US until around 12,000 years ago. Multiple peccary species were present in North America to greet the first humans, the largest being Mylohus, which weighed about 150 pounds. Some other pretty cool North American natives were two relatives of the musk oxen, which is still present in Canada, the shrub ox, which seems to have been a browser and lived from California down to central Mexico, and the woodland musk ox, significantly taller and leaner than its stocky cousin that lives on in the Arctic today. Related to the musk oxen are goats and sheep. Some of you will be familiar with the mountain goat that lives on in the Rocky Mountains and other alpine regions of northern North America. But you may not have heard of Harrington's mountain goat, which was found in southwestern US as well as Mexico. Like most of the animals on this list, Harrington's mountain goat went extinct around 11 to 12,000 years ago, a time that coincides with the establishment of the Clovis people across North America, though it's not proven that humans were the sole cause of the extinctions. I mentioned earlier the cats and the bears, but we didn't yet look at the big dogs. Alongside grey wolves, red wolves and eastern wolves lived the dire wolf. The dire wolf was a little larger than the grey wolf we know today, though not significantly. Its head though was quite a lot larger and its bite force much stronger, making it much more capable of breaking bones and accessing bone marrow, an incredibly valuable food source. It's believed that horses were an important part of their diet and also bison, camelids and ground sloths, making them direct competitors with cave lions and smilodon. Bison made their way to North America across the Bering Land Bridge from Asia. The originals would have been steppe bison, which later evolved into multiple species, including the biggest bovid of all time, the long-horned bison, which is said to have weighed almost two tons, making it twice the weight of plains bison today, with massive horns spanning almost seven feet wide. There were also bison antiquus. This too would have been significantly larger than present-day bison, but it is the direct ancestor to the modern American bison. American bison today are essentially a pygmy version of their ancestor, and it's believed by many that this shrinking was a direct response to hunting pressure put on them by humans through both the specific targeting of larger specimens and the fact that smaller animals reproduce more quickly, an important factor in surviving persistent hunting pressure. Another North American giant was Castoroides, the giant beaver, which could weigh almost 280 pounds, roughly the same as the rock at his heaviest. Like its still existing little cousin, 
the giant beaver spent most of its time in the water and it would have consumed mostly submerged vegetation, though we don't have any evidence of dam building to date. Now, onto the biggest animals of Pleistocene North America. There were four species of elephanted. First up, we have Cuvier's Gomphothier, which weighed about as much as an Asian elephant. There was the American Mastodon, which as you can see looked quite different to living elephantids. Despite being shorter in height than African elephants, they would have actually been heavier due to their stocky build. Though mastodons are often depicted as having fur, we actually have little evidence to suggest this was the case. The woolly mammoth on the other hand, which was also present in northern US and Canada, most definitely was covered in hair. But the biggest animals the first North Americans met, that trophy goes to the Colombian mammoth, which stood up to 14 feet tall and weighed up to 10 tons. For reference, large African bull elephants today rarely reach even 7 tons. Though there have been a couple of outliers that weighed over 10 tons, the largest alive today weighs only 8. To me, it's absolutely fascinating that around the same time as Gobekli Tepe was being built in Turkey, so in the time of human civilization, this huge collection of animals, several elephantids, wild horses, bison, camels and pronghorn migrated in massive herds across North America and had to watch their backs for American lions, smilodon, giant short-faced bears and dire wolves. The first North Americans must have been in a constant state of both awe and terror. In this video on screen, I speak about the best remnants of the American Serengeti that can still be seen today and what could be done to restore some of the incredible wilderness the first humans saw in North America. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel to help it grow. Thank you, as always, for watching.